This episode of Shadowversity is brought to you by the Longsword Shirt. Available through Teespring, link in the description. Shadowversity. Greetings, I'm Shad. And the classic medieval cruciform styled sword in its one-handed and two-handed variations is grossly misunderstood throughout the world. So I'm making this video to more comprehensively debunk the most common myths about European medieval swords. And I know for my regular viewer, a lot of the information I'll be mentioning here isn't going to be anything new. But I'm making it for them as a resource to point people towards when they come across people who say really inaccurate things, but also for people who are new to uh, the awesomeness of European swords and how cool they are. Now, I like all swords as well, all right? If you have a look here, you'll see katanas, you'll see Chinese swords. Yeah, I just love swords, but I have an unashamed bias towards the uh, European style swords. One, because of my own cultural heritage, but two, is that like what I believe when looked at because, yeah, I actually used to be a big Katana fanboy, okay? I thought they were the best. But when I started to learn about swords uh, really, you know, objectively, what qualities make them good and what not, from my own observations, I found so many awesome things about European swords that made me prefer them, even from coming from an area where uh, I uh, was biased against them. And this is the thing, because I held some of these misconceptions as well, so let's get into them. First of all, European swords are not blunt and clubs. Eh? And I have heard this uh, being promoted on full-fledged, like, documentaries that are supposed to be made by people who know their stuff, and they'll say, the European swords were mostly blunt and they couldn't really cut through a thing, they were just made as clubs to beat their opponents into submission. That so stupid. I wonder if this myth has arisen out of a different type of historical fact, and it comes into the usefulness of swords against European armour. And because European armour got really good, I'm talking, and just alone, not alone, like mail is really effective against swords, but when you get it into plate and hardened, okay, properly tempered plate armour, no sword can cut through it. European, Japanese, Chinese, Indian, Middle Eastern, no, no, you can't cut through steel plate. And the things that show, you know, swords cutting through steel is poor quality steel that's really thin. Try and do that against a European, a proper European breastplate. Not one that's made out of tin plated dirt, okay? Proper European breastplate. A sword will never cut through it, no matter the type of sword. And so I wonder if the concept that a sword just can't, you know, European sword can't cut through anything, they're button clubs made to beat people to death, it comes from the ineffectiveness of any type of sword against proper armor. And that includes Japanese, you know, good made samurai armor as well. You can't cut through it. And so a sword is actually less effective than a club against proper armor. But that doesn't mean they are bluntened clubs, all right? They're not. European swords were sharp, and in fact they've found historical swords that still have a pretty sharp edge on them. The other origin where this myth might have arisen is that the fact that uh, half-sorting, where there's a style of sword fighting where Europeans will grab the sword mid-blade, and people think, well, they, you could only grab the sword halfway down the blade if it was blunt. No, that's not true. I will reference this video from Scarla Grimm, a great YouTuber who does this stuff as well, uh, showing that you can grab sharp swords, middle of the blade, half sorting, and go nuts, especially if you've got a gloved hand. No, and it's the way you grab it, but also, if you're not <laughs> sliding your hand up and down, you can grab a sharp blade. In fact, pause. Here is a sharp knife, okay? Had this for years, you know, camping knife. And it is also sharp okay and so i'll put my thumb on it and i'm applying a lot of pressure no cut okay so it's so now if i did that while putting the same pressure oh, i'd have a really severe cut but that's the thing okay uh you'll only cut yourself on a sharp blade if you you know slide and do a slash now can that happen when you're half sorting there's a risk but if you're holding it tight enough in the and you, if you're you know holding it on the edge of the blade like that and you have gloves, the risk of cutting yourself is actually very, very low. There are some instances where uh, they would keep the bottom part of the blade bluntened on European swords, so they can finger the guard like this, which gives them more point control. 
uh, and they, it was done on both that one-handed arming swords and also two-handed long swords. So perhaps because there are instances of uh, European swords or parts of their blades being specifically unsharpened, that uh, people have then extend to that thinking, the whole blade must be unsharpened. No, because there are also cases where they've kept the bottom half of the blade dull as well. Why? Well, mainly you're gonna be hitting with the top part. And so again, half sorting, if people are you know, worried about the sliding and the cutting, they will keep this part of the blade bluntened to facilitate half sorting and keeping this sharp. But still, the actual cutting part, very sharp and yeah, definitely cut through people as well. Next myth to debunk. European swords were heavy clubs. Ah, oh, what a absolute piece of bull, okay? Again, I, I saw this statement from a documentary where they were comparing, it's fine, it's always the Japanese sword katana versus European swords, and they were comparing, oh, the Japanese one's so light. Well, actually, no. The average katana weighs more than the average European sword, both arming sword and long, long swords can come in a bit heavier in some instances because they're two-handed and they're longer, for one and they have pummels, big handles, and other things like that, but not always. In fact, for its size, the Japanese katana is actually a, a kind of heavy sword. The average weight for a European one-handed sword is about one kilo. One to 1.2, it depends, but that's the average. What, one to 1.2 kilos, that's nothing, all right? And that's the average for one-handed one. Two-handed swords, long swords, there will be 1.5 to 2 kilos, 2 kilos being the higher end. But still, only 2 kilos, that is not heavy! The European style swords can feel very nimble in the hands and wrists to redirect. Uh, not, uh, so different to a heavy, cumbersome, awkward club. Oh, so it just uh, ticks me off to no end. People say, oh, they're heavy clubs. You idiots! They're not! If you hear anyone ever say that European swords are dull, heavy, unbalanced clubs, already you will know they have no idea what they're talking about. Next, they will say European swords are all made out of poor, crappy steel. That is such a... <sighs> no, not at all. In fact, the standard, good quality European sword is made out of really, really good steel, okay? Not just good steel, I, in the latter part of the medieval period, spring steel, which is basically the best steel you can have for a sword. There are some comparable, you know, types in terms of hardened steel, so not very flexible, really hard. They can be all right, but their durability is less. A spring steel sword uh, is able to withstand so much more abuse than any other type of steel. And in terms of steel purity, not having slag and other uh, non-metallic elements in the blade, because their smelting technology got to a pretty good level, so we're talking crucible steel, they, because they could get so hot, right, that enables the removal of all the, you know, non-metallic elements in the steel to a very large degree because it fully liquefies. Steel needs to be heated up to around 3000 degrees to fully liquefy and that's, that's hard for, you know, feudal age technology. And there are many cultures whose uh, uh, smelting methods didn't get that hot. Case in point, the Japanese Tatara didn't get hot enough to fully liquefy. That's why the type of steel that comes out of it, it has so many different qualities of carbon content. And so they actually break it up based on how sh how uh, shiny it is. Like the more shiny and more silvery the steel is, the more carbon it has in it. And they have to break it up and, and uh, you know, put it into piles uh, to determine the levels of carbon content. And that is a direct, that, the reason why this happens is because the steel doesn't fully liquefy and the carbon can't mix around uniformly. It's ununiform in these, in these blobby chunks as a result of imperfect smelting technology. It doesn't get hot enough. But in Europe, they did. And, in, and it's funny, in different periods, okay, because steel quality is a spectrum. You will always have poor quality steel, okay, so, which led to poor quality swords in Europe and every other part in the world. Middle East, India, also in Asia and Japan. But if you really want to compare best to the best, the quality of steel in Europe was phenomenal, okay? And if we, if, even if you go to the early medieval period during the Viking Age, uh, the Scandinavians, through trading and stuff, got their hands on some crazy good steel. They say it was, you know, most likely made out of India, which led to the creation of the Ulfbert, Ulf, Ulf, Ulfbert blades. Ulf, I can't pronounce it. 
but these are some crazy good blades that the Vikings had. And in terms of the concept of folding or laminating a steel versus mono steel, folding steel is only necessary as a result of imperfect steel. If you had good quality pure steel, no need to fold it at all. Folding can lead to a blade of very comparable to equivalent quality as a purified mono steel one. And if it's better tempered, okay, yes, which means the quenching and tempering process was done better, it can result to a higher quality blade than a blade made out of pure steel that was not tempered, sorry, quenched and tempered properly, because that's a very crucial part in this you know, sword make making process. But ultimately, a more purified mono steel has far greater potential to result in a higher quality blade than anything that required folding, okay? You can still fold pure steel and get a good quality blade, but if the steel required it, it only required it if the steel had impurities in it. Now, I started this video off talking about the European cruciform style blade because that's what most people think of. That alone actually spreads a slight kind of misconception, and that is the belief that all European swords were the same. They all had, you know, profiles like this, but the amount of, of variety and variation in European swords is huge. One of the bigger misconceptions about the variations is that they were not all double-edged. There were a massive amount of single-edged blades, okay, and they were used very prominently. So we're talking about not only like the falchion, but there's the mesa, but these are more categories of a type of sword than referring to a specific sword themselves because there are heaps of different variations of falchion and messes with different blade profiles and also cross guards as well, rings and everything. So side rings on the cross guards, what I mean when I say that. So again, not all European swords were double edged. Huge amount of single edged, but if we just go back to the double edged ones, a huge amount of variation as well in regards to how much the blade tapers. So if you look at the profile, profile taper, does it taper to an acute point or is it, you know, a big chopping more of a heavy ended blade? But as well there, the amount of distal taper on the blades. Does the distal taper start halfway up or does it start from the very base of the blade? The type of cross section it has. How many fullers does it even have a fuller? Does it have a diamond cross section versus a hexagonal cross section? All these variations make to a very diverse range of very effective swords that can be made to emphasize certain qualities more effectively, such as cutting or thrusting. And finally, one of the larger myths about European swords is that there was no sophisticated martial arts developed for their use. I mean, it just, people think that martial arts only came from Asia because of the popularization that has happened from it, which really started in the 1900s. Now, in terms of the balance between unarmed martial arts in Europe versus unarmed martial arts in other parts of the world, and we've got to go with the biggest one where martial arts, you know, is usually attributed to, so Asia, I could be wrong in this assumption. I'm just stating what I have noticed from my observation. There seems to be less structured unarmed styles of martial arts out of Europe than there are out of Asia, which I find really interesting. Again, this is only an observation that I've made based on my own research. I could be wrong and there could be people that will disagree with me. So take from this what you will. The thing is about combat, and this is very interesting. Um, as soon as you add a force multiplier into the mix, it can change up the game completely. So you can have someone who's trained their whole life in unarmed martial arts. They can do these great kicks and great punches and everything like that. And as soon as you, um, and they could be usually, they could probably be most people who have only a mild level of training in combat versus his usually extensive one. But as soon as you add a force multiplier, weapons into the mix changes. So you give this person who only has a moderate level of training a knife. Suddenly his lethality potential he shoots up so much higher than the guys trained years upon years. And in terms of efficiency, just, you know, do you want to train years upon years to be able to uh, beat this guy, you know, defend yourself adequately, or train a little bit, carry a knife on you, and be far more effective at defending yourself than the guys trained years upon years. So, you know, there's that balance. The thing what I'm getting to here is that weapons were 
so prominent in Europe for self-defense, from knives to swords. Unarmed martial arts needed to be developed when weapons were not available to people. And so when you have peasant societies that can't use weapons, well then they'll start to develop martial arts that don't require weapons, but also martial arts around weapons that are adaptations on farming implements. And you can attribute a lot of Asian styles of martial arts down to that simple fact. Go over to Europe, Europeans understood force multiplication. Grab a knife, grab a sword, you don't need to do years and years of training. If you're moderately accurate, you'll be good enough. But then, what if you did the years and years of training on the force multiplier, like swordsmanship and fighting with knives and stuff like that? Suddenly your lethality potential jumps up again. And so weapons were just more popular in Europe and martial arts were developed around those weapons. So again, this is why unarmed martial arts aren't as prevalent. They certainly did exist, okay? Absolutely they existed, but they were not from my own observation, as prominent as in Asia. But when you look at the diversity and the sophistication in the weapon-based martial arts, and this is where what the rise of HEMA is, historical European martial arts, they are all based on historical sources, documents, treatises, manuals, manuscripts from the period that are teaching swordsmanship. And the sophisticated techniques that have been rediscovered through studying this is just phenomenal. It's, it's, it's amazing. I've been interested in swordsmanship my whole, li whole life, right? And so from starting as a kid in the backyard, picking up a wooden sword that I made out of just, you know, scrap timber and hitting trees, okay? From there, all the way through to studying kendo, looking at kenjutsu and other things like that. It is only when I started to look at HEMA did I discover how to properly use a double-bladed sword and the sophisticated techniques and how they're really meant to be used, my goodness, it's incredible. So this stuff worked and it is hugely sophisticated and effective. It is, and guess what? It comes from the period it existed. There's no question that Europe did not have martial arts. They did. No question, stop saying that. And there you go, those are the main myths that I wanted to just destroy, okay? This is the truth about European swords. So, well, let's, let's get things right. Thank you for watching, I hope you have enjoyed, and I hope this video will stand as a, as a reference point uh, for people who have any type of misconceptions about what these awesome swords are like. I hope to see you again, and until that time, farewell.